I guess. Triple checking. Okay, please go. Okay. Hi, everybody. Yes. So this is my IS, and it's going to be on photojournalism. Yay, so let's start. So the first question is, why this topic? Well, why photojournalism and not any other photography? There's so many different kinds out there, right? Because uh, photojournalism claims to be the most objective photography there is, and it's, uh, white, it, it has a widespread use as evidence. So for example, your crime scenes or uh, on the newspapers as well. So this is why it makes it very interesting to, whether, uh, to see what kind of knowledge does it give us as well as to test if it is really the most objective photography there is or it's just like, it's, it's the same as art or something else. So that's why it's important. Okay. So generally, I have two main questions. What knowledge does photojournalism give us? And to analyze what knowledge does it give us, we have to see what is it and how it is made. And First of all, because it claims to be the most objective photography there is, um, we can analyze it as a sort of science. Because after all, the camera is a tool, is a machine that honestly captures light. So a photograph is a measurement of light. It can be thought of as um, the intensity and the wavelength of light encoded into, in, in, into a, a piece of data. So yeah, in that sense, it is a scientific measurement, uh, which is proposed by Kendall Walton in his transparency thesis. Uh, light is the pencil of nature and photography is the drawing. So there exists a direct causal relationship between the reality outside and the photograph because of the light reducing the, the film. So when the light hits the film, it causes a reaction and that's how the film came to be. So there is a direct causal relationship be between whatever's outside and the photograph. Okay. However, even with this direct, uh, direct causal relationship, there could be some problems with uh, photography, especially when we, um, it's not exactly a measurement of the outside world. If we want to judge primary qualities such as space, extension, distance, and so on, if we use different types of camera equipment, we can see that you cannot really tell um, the distance that accurately. You can zoom all the way in, and you think that you're really close to the, the lady here, uh, but in actual fact, you, you can zoom all the way out, and you cannot, uh, and, and then the distance is ex exaggerated, so you cannot accurately tell distance from a photograph. So primary qualities may not be even that um, <coughs> understandable, I guess, through photography. And for secondary qualities, well, this becomes a sort of an arbitrary divide because on one hand you can shoot in color, on the other hand you can shoot in black and white. And of course, if you shoot in black and white, you're stripping away all the color, which is a secondary quality. So not all photography can fully encapsulate the second, uh, secondary qualities as well. So I guess um, from all of this that we've looked so far, the sensible route to take is that uh, we can only infer the existence of places and objects in a photograph because of this causal relationship between whatever's outside and whatever ends up on the image. Without the causal link, a photograph is just a hyper-realistic painting. So imagine this. If you have a photograph is just a set of pixels, right? So if you have a bunch of square tiles and you ask a very good painter to take a look at whatever's outside and uh, paint each tile a shape of a, a color, then the entire array of tiles would be exactly will look exactly the same as a photograph. But you cannot say that whatever is depicted in that uh, tile work is actually in existence outside. And the reason of this is because the, of the causal link. Without, that's why uh, in order to only accurately infer the existence of places and objects outside that's represented on the image, we need that causal link. Now, uh, I don't know some young girls here if you know this. So this is actually a hyper-realistic painting. This is not a photograph, but if you take a look at it, and you conclude that hey, it is a photograph, and therefore it has that causal link, so there indeed exists such a piece of meat. Well, it may be a Gettier case where if, well, that can happen. So that's problematic if we think of photojournalism as science. So, but, and there's also another caveat here, which is that transparency only applies to film and not digital photography. There is a, quite a fundamental difference in the technology of the camera sensor itself. Because in digital photography, the camera sensor actually records one third of the light data and extrapolates the remaining two-thirds. 
So there isn't a direct causal relationship in terms of the light comes in and boom, there's a pigment on that piece of film anymore. It is rather uh, the light comes in and only one third of the picture is, has the pigment and the camera sensor itself runs an algorithm to guess what the gaps are and fills in the gaps without, the, without any relationship with the light. So it's fully algorithmic, it's fully mathematic. So that presents a problem to the correspondence uh, if, we, if, we were to see, if we were to take a photograph as a scientific measurement of uh, external reality. So demosaicing defeats the transparency thesis and um, if we take a very strict approach uh, with regards to photojournalism and science, a photograph is at best one third a measurement and the remaining two thirds has no direct causal relationship with reality at all. So on a scale of objectivity, it could be argued that this is the case. You know, hyper-realistic painting being uh, a creation, a product of human engineering, and a film photo being the most objective along all along the scale among all the options and the digital photo lies in between. And noting that most photography, uh, no, most of photojournalism uh, in recent in the last 10 years is digital, this challenges the uh, thesis that photojournalism is a science is, is adopts a scientific method. So uh, this is just after all this discussion uh, regarding the justification of photojournalism as science. It is, uh, uses reliabilism because the photographic process is a truth conducive process that uh, suggests a high likelihood that whatever's outside is indeed whatever's on the image because of their direct causal relationship or otherwise, uh, even with the demosaicing, because nowadays the, the algorithms have grown so, so good that it is almost the case, although it's not entirely the case, so it's reliabilist. And it's of course correspondent because you want to have a, like a matching between what's on the image and what's outside. Okay, so, but take a look at long exposures, for example. How is this a scientific measurement? So what, you, what knowledge can this photograph give you? It is a photojournalistic photograph. It, is, it did get published in the newspaper. But if you, taking the scientific measurement approach, uh, can, you, uh, can you argue that a car exists and it's moving fast? But of course there's a problem because actually the car is blurred. So if in, these, in this extreme case, when everything is blurred but not too blurred, can you know if it really is a car and not some random car-like object? Or can you know if it's really moving? So how can you infer that directly from the, uh, from the image? You can only at best infer existence, right? And be, besides the car, there's also another big problem with this, which is that uh, from this image, we take that correspondent theory Night light, we can argue that night lights exist as streets, um, and that is a reasonable knowledge claim if we take the existence of the object and the one to one correspondence. But again, this poses similar problems whether light streets exist or light street light objects exist, or whether these things even exist at all. Well, actually, it's just because of the, the motion of the camera that causes this blur, it doesn't imply that there is such a, an object of this shape in reality. So, that's again a problem of uh, photojournalism is science. So what does this all point to? Perhaps photojournalism is not a science and it's more subjective than that. So maybe it, is, um, it tries to copy reality but it distorts reality in the process. So what is something like this? Well, of course, art. So photojournalism may be art. Um, photo taking necessitates the author's active intervention because if you don't do, if you don't set some camera settings and you don't press the button and if you don't decide the time at which you press the button, uh, no photograph is made. So the photographic process, although mechanically speaking, is scientific, but when and how it's conducted is subjective and subject to the author's active intervention. And the author is free to control how light is processed. So here we turn to intentionalism. Photojournalists, uh, photojournalists maintain an authorial intent over their works. So they can choose what, so what, whatever setting they want to choose, they can shoot whatever they want to shoot. Uh, and therefore, a photograph is a construct by the photojournalist, it's constructed by them. And if you take a look at this photograph, so now what knowledge can we get out of, uh, out of photojournalism if we take it as art? Uh, if we look at this photograph, Angola, can we make the claim that I know that war is devastating because I, I feel very strongly impacted by this photograph when I look at it, um, the positioning of the people in the photograph as well as the, uh, the bullet holes in the, in the walls. So I therefore conclude that I know that war is devastating. My emotional aesthetic response from whatever I see 
um, or I can just merely say this photograph is beautiful, which is another possible knowledge claim. So this points to the fact that we are not just engaging with the horrifying subject matter of within the photograph, but treating the photograph per se as a product. So it's no longer a transparent uh, frame through which we, we view reality, but it itself is an object that is worthy of analysis and can give knowledge. So our knowledge of photojournalism, or the, rather the knowledge that photojournalism gives us, it's not just what is contained within the image, it's the actual image itself because it can evoke certain uh, aesthetic and emotional responses within us. But uh, there is a bit of grey area here. What is the boundary between photojournalism and art? So can we consider anything published in the newspapers as just journalism photography? What is the... Is there, is, is there a fine line or is there even a line at all? Even proper hard journalism photographs, if you, if you take a look at uh, maybe a very simple case, if I, if I go to Hong Lim Park and I shoot a protest, it is by nature visual, and because it's visual, it uh, involves our senses, and that is, it has aesthetic qualities. Uh, yeah. So, photojournalism is art, the knowledge claims that we can get out of that are generally uh, justification is coherentness, and the, the theory of truth here we use is correspondent. If a photograph is beautiful, then it is beautiful. And synthesizing these two approaches, uh, considering photojournalism as science and photojournalism as art, we also have to consider photojournalism as history because um, although it's, it's because in this grey area, this overlap between a bit of science and a bit of art, um, photojournalism derives its use. All facts are equal but some facts are more equal than others. As an active in intervener in the photographic process, the photojournalist has to select what gets recorded and what does not get recorded as well as how it is recorded and how it is not recorded. So, uh, this itself is not a problem, but the use of photojournalism or, role, or the role that photojournalism plays uh, today uh, makes this a very big problem because if you choose which angle, if you, freely, if you can freely choose which angle to shoot or what settings to use, you, uh, as you can uh, infer, you can imply certain things, you can, you can suggest different things. So it's not entirely an objective scientific measurement anymore. So these two photographs can illustrate the differences that Trump's inauguration. Uh, the photograph on the left <laughs> emphasizes that the, the emptiness of the people at the back actually, whereas the other one is on the photograph on the right is shot from the stage, from the podium, and it emphasizes the people in front but because of the physical nature of how lenses work, then the, the, the crowds in the back get diminished and you, can't, you, you think that the whole national mall is, is full. Whereas if you take a different angle, it is not. And this becomes uh, problematic because not only this is a problem of how a photograph is made, it also, it also concerns how it is used and how it is seen. So again, it's not just about the act of taking a photograph of the photograph itself is about how the photograph is presented and displayed to people that shapes the nature and construction of the knowledge photojournalism gives us when we first encounter or experience photojournalism. And apart from the selection of facts, there is also the interpretation of facts and perhaps possible narrativism if we combine uh, not just the photograph itself, but if we run it in a, in a we run it on print, so if you publish it in a newspaper, there must be captions and other things. And the, the, the objects that we place around each photo also adds and subtracts from whatever meaning that it has. So it's when we in, when we interact with photojournalism, we're not just interacting with the photo itself, but we're interacting with the whole display of whatever comes around it, whatever how is it how it is packaged to us. And uh, think about this: if only one photo is recorded in history, what can we know about past events through photojournalism? So, uh, uh, Especially with the caption, because that's how it's run on, on, uh, on the press, right? So, if only one is recorded, then it's just certainly problematic because it can be used to advance a particular narrative. And also there is a, another problem, of, uh, rather than a problem, there is also the uh, issue of the cooler shock effect, which is, again, highlights the importance of the placement of photographs. So, if taking the same, scene, uh, the same photograph on the left, and we place another one side by side, uh, we sort of imply that the person on the left, Patrick in the program, is looking at the thing on the right. So, in the first case, it can mean sadness, second case, it mean hunger, and third case, uh, could perhaps imply lust. So, it's the placement of different photographs and how they are combined together also shapes the knowledge that we get out of the entire display. 
So generally, uh, photojournalist of history, it's again reliable and uh, the, it's uh, and, the, and the theory of truth I use it is correspondence. So at the end of the day, uh, there is this question of is there photojournalistic knowledge or knowledge that photojournalism gives us? Um, what we can see through this throughout this investigation is that photojournalism constructs knowledge through a mix of scientific, artistic, and historical processes. Uh, and interesting thing about each of them is that we can neither accept nor reject photojournalism as purely science, art, or history. It, it takes a bit of each and take and it takes a bit of each and uh, rejects a bit of each. And sometimes the merits of a field of knowledge are the demerits of another. So, for example, objectivity is hailed as a virtue in science, whereas in art, pluralist. Uh, subjective interpretations could be valued as well. So, can we say that photojournalist knowledge is more scientific than artistic or historical? Which, uh, in other words, uh, could we say that if I look at a photograph, the more important thing is what objects are displayed and what causal inferences I can make uh, of that object's existence as compared to uh, the emotional, experiential knowledge that I gained from viewing that photograph or maybe even the historical value of the photograph and what it tells us about events in the past. So which one of, or which of these do we place in priority? So if we cannot, um, if we cannot list them in priority, if we cannot order them as to which is the most important part of each photograph, then maybe photojournalism is just a mix of all these three. Uh, it gives us hybridized knowledge. Uh, it, it is not, but, uh, but seemingly the problem of this is that uh, there are external implications as well. For example, are other types of knowledge themselves hybrids? Can JTB account for this hybrid? Because individually, for art, science, and history, JTB can account for each of them. Not, not even in art, because uh, truth comes, becomes a problem in art. So, especially when you mix everything together, can J it is knowledge, we do get knowledge, but can JTB account for this, this hybridized knowledge? And can we even classify knowledge into various types in the first place? Would be another extension of this. So, uh, this is just random. Uh, can we know beauty through math? It seems to be reasoning, but uh, I find this very beautiful. So, maybe again another mix and hybridization of knowledge. So, uh, thanks. Over to you. Yeah, um, I find it interesting you use science, art, and history, but not ethics. Yeah, so I was looking at maybe, in this sense, um, you're looking at photojournalism as a source of knowledge rather than a physical for knowledge. Mm. Because in terms of ethics, photojournalism um, is a um, I can answer that. Yeah. I think by ethics you mean the content of ethics yeah. and not the theory of ethics. Yeah. And as this is epistemology, it wouldn't be interested in content. You mean, can a photograph make you think that something is bad? Yeah. In the same sense that uh, other things, I just want to go into uh, imagery of that. And then to do the same thing about a discussion about ethical theories. Yeah. And for example, the Google image of South Korea versus North Korea at night. One country has light. Then this is as a source of knowledge on different political systems. So that is in political science. Also in um, social science. Yeah. yeah, social science. So we got the lot. That's 2,500. Yeah. <laughs> Six is into that then go. About 400 each, nine words each. Is there any we missed out? Oh, yeah, I can justify my selection of whatever I'll analyze. Yeah. I think I can do that first, then I proceed to analyze to you. I can get, I can get um, science and history, because those are, uh, no, sorry, science and art, because those are like, more inherent knowledge than yeah. photography. <coughs> but for history, that's a different concept. Of I see it. Yeah. So maybe you want to take history as a third. Yeah, this is yes. hist history in the making, isn't it? When people look back, they will look at this photograph and construct their historical. Yeah, maybe you shift from. At the very beginning, you, you said, I take these three areas ah, as okay. examples and indicate that at the end, part of the mongrelization, hybridization, bastardization of knowledge <laughs> would be that, in fact, are you going to go so far as to say that everything is all six, actually? And these are artificial divisions. Uh, I was just going to ask about the timeline, but like, 
it seems like a very broad topic because at first I, I thought you were going I wasn't very sure what was your conclusion that I made because you were using different lenses to like different types of knowledge but during the problem that I had with you was that it, it's all conditioned upon how photojournalism is being used like um, in a sense that if I'm going to use uh, when I'm going to talk about mathematical beauty technically speaking I'm not talking about making reference I do not necessarily make specific reference to the math itself it could just be more of an artistic purely artistic thing so I think the other question that I a uh, notion I had when I thought about the type of knowledge was my first <coughs> thing that came out of was is it a uh, empowering knowledge or is it a knowledge of the world sort of thing or passive knowledge etc so originally I thought that was your the conclusion you were getting at that um, the sort of knowledge you were getting because we are from for example history for example is knowledge of the world uh, so it would be more of an empirical sort of knowledge right not really of abstract concepts or, or empowering in nature so that was the sort of that I thought you were going on but since then, we are going to say that it's a hybridization of different spheres of knowledge. I'm not so sure what is the meaningfulness of this, this statement. Since um, stating that in of itself only tells me that this is relevant to another sphere of knowledge, but doesn't tell me or value add towards what is the implication it has towards this or uh, this hardware sphere of knowledge. I, see, uh, I, see, I, 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 I think I didn't say it that clearly in my presentation, but. Um, the hybridization of these knowledge, each of these knowledge uh, comes in a different way. So science wants to tell us knowledge about the world, science is empirical, uh, and along with all the theories of truth and justification that goes with scientific knowledge. And same with uh, art and same with history. So I, I didn't make it clear, but um, along with the hybridization of these different types of knowledge, the characteristics that like each of these knowledge has is also is also mixed together. So I don't think I can come up with a uh, sort of, I won't say percentage, right? I can't qualify like what is what is more than the other, but um, with all of this mixing, like each of their own characteristics also mixed together as well. Okay, so in a uh, to correct me if I'm wrong, so your conclusion in the sense is, um, photojournalism can give us knowledge. Photojournalism can give us any sort of knowledge depending on how it's being used and interpreted. Is that right? Yeah, kind of. Or rather, the, the, the kind of knowledge that it gives us cannot be easily categorized. It is both a priori in the sense if you take it as art, and it's both uh, and it's uh, positivist if you take it as science. So it's kind of like both at the same time. Of that. So, which is quite interesting because if, if, can there be knowledge that they both at the same time or are they polar opposites? So maybe if everything is if it's not pure, then we love everything under empiricism or something like that. So that would be a further discussion. I think the reason why I have this issue is because it seems that uh, all this exists as assertions as opposed to evaluating the strength of the justifications that uh, that you are trying to claim. So in theory, it is true that um, math can be like scientific in a sense. This of uh, um, experimental physics is just applied math to some degree. Math can be art as well. You can also have a history of science, history of mathematics and development. So historical epistemology and things like that. So to me it seems more of a situation whereby in theory most of the things can be can we can agree uh, in theory these um, spheres of knowledge have overlaps. But it seems more likely that the argument is about why is it that we tend to see things in a specific way. Uh, so for the so why is it more likely to be a specific sphere of knowledge? Not mean because that it's used in this way, but because the justification, the strength of the justification behind it. So maybe the question is also, um, seeing that I think for me at least, I felt like for parts of the sphere of knowledge, it's assumed that it is a knowledge as opposed that it is a belief or a true belief of some sort. So it seems like there needs to be a greater emphasis on why is it that why is it that we can call this a justice? This uh, JTB or justified, this justified claim knowledge, and in comparison to the other sets of knowledge, are they equally justified or are they more justified? It seems right now it's either a situation whereby they are all equally true and equally valid as a source of knowledge, but I don't think that it is the case, and I'm quite sure at least to some degree photojournalism does keep, or at least as a source of photojournalism, role. it seems to be stronger at being maybe historical um, sort of knowledge as opposed to maybe ethical knowledge. Uh, this is also the point, okay, but uh, I do think that there's some sort of um, difference in strength or justification depending on the level okay. of yeah. But I'm not sure about this. So. 
Sorry, I, I think like tapping on to what we can say is all. But another way of putting it is, um, I thought there are two questions that you have to deal with in your IS structure. So the first one is, what is photojournalism? And the second one is, this thing that is photojournalism, can it give knowledge and what sort of knowledge it is giving? So to the first question, you have answered that photojournalism is science, it is art, it's history. Then for different characterization of what it is, to answer the second question in different ways. But I think one mysterious part that you have to answer as we always pointed out is, is it science or art or history? Because like, you haven't explained how it can be compatible of all three at the same time. So if there's a correspondence or there's a causal relation between the photograph, then it is clearly science. Or maybe it's not the best form of measurement, but it's still science. Then how is it possible that it is still art? Or if it is art and history, then how much of the scientific element remains? Yeah, so, um, so to qualify how much of each? It's not really qualifying how much of each, just like explaining how it can be both at the same time, or if oh, okay. it is predominantly yeah. an eye of creation, then how much does the element of science that remains um, affect the knowledge that it is produced? So I think your characterization can be clearer, instead of just saying one as this, then as this, then as this, this discussed separately. Okay. Yeah. Um, then actually second part, like regarding can give knowledge, is just a thought. Um, because it seems that photojournalism has a lot of like parallel with perception or the field of perception in itself. So I think in all of your appraisal of can it give knowledge for something, you can point to the arguments um, about realism, like direct realism, indirect realism or something. But I think it may be helpful. Yes, actually there's a double field of perception which I choose. I, I don't know whether it's <laughs> right to leave up, but it's, 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 it's 3,000 words. Uh. I, think maybe, I, I think maybe it's more interesting if you focus on that and choose the scope. But I'm not sure about that because thinking about it, right? If, um, if I'm Si, I can also talk about how Chinese painting is not just a reflection of Taoist knowledge, but knowledge about, for example, Chinese history, Chinese culture, and maybe the painter's life. If I'm Eugene, I can also do scientific observations under the environment of AR, uh, uh, VR. Um, if I'm Zhejiang, of course, the quantification itself is a mathematical knowledge, but he's talking about that thing in, 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 in the, the legal domain. So, it seems that all these sources of knowledge are always like, like, like always only one of those are emphasized, whereas here, you, yeah, you are you are taking different approaches. So similarly, I can also see like Euler's theorem as a reflection of the the um, uh, European uh, intellectual history. I can do sociology of uh, math and science the same way uh, um, Kuhn did, but but I think that those are parallel things and. If you want to do, I'm, I'm not sure how to do the hybridized style, but I just, but most, I think more common like all, all the other things I've seen is focusing on one, and maybe you can talk about the double way of question, which is more epistemology. So just one last point. Mm -hmm. I think like um, there are many parallel tracks. So if it's science, you can talk about verbal perception. If it's high history, you can talk about like the relation between the communication from the transmitter to the audience, and like the different epistemic implications. But I think. What can help with your choice of choosing which track, which track to go with is to answer your first question, what is art in a more rigorous manner? So is it, like, what is photojournalism in a more rigorous manner? Is it art or history or is it science? Because you say that it's a science, you have backings for it, it's the causal theory. So it's art, you have backings. So I think if your eventual, like, agreement is that it is art with an element of scientific uh, objectivity, then, like, that will determine how you go on to your second question. Ah, okay. <clears throat> yes, yes, yes. Okay, so I just um, somewhat, I think all of these now are sort of circling and homing in on the same thing, and that is where is it going and why and what is the conclusion? And there's a relationship problem between all these different areas, um, and how do you resolve that? Um, my thought was that the conclusion might be photojournalism at one time trades on the subjective to overcome the objective element, and at the other time trades on the objective to overcome the subjective element. So the Trump picture, that's a subjective perversion of reality to which science says no, um, this is objective fact. Um, the camera never lies. So the objective nature of the photograph is used to defend or to uh, minimize the accusation that it's propaganda. Um, whereas on the other side, of course, when you make objective claims about photojournalism, there are many 